is proud to bring you a three-part series to honor the Anishinaabe Ojibwa in our region. White Earth was made by a treaty with 10 Mississippi chiefs from the Gull Lake region of March 19th, 1867. So White Earth was in its initial uh, origin was a Mississippi Chippewa reservation and that's what the government calls us. Chippewa is a mispronunciation of Ojibwa and Ojibwa I'm told by my grandparents who, who were born 1900 and before means to pucker by roasting. So we used to uh, roast our uh, deer hides and, and to treat them and uh, then we made moccasins with a puckered seam on the toe. So then my grandmother and grandfather also said that we used to capture our enemies and stake them to the ground and then we would make a nice hot fire next to them and they would Ojibwa. So the shoe story is much more diplomatic but it's part of oral tradition also. And then we call ourselves in our ceremonies and in, a, in our natural way, if you will, uh, Anishinaabe. So we are Anishinaabe Ojibwe. Before White Earth was White Earth, uh, one of our constituent bands at White Earth, the main contingent came from Gull Lake. So before we were at White Earth, we were at Gull Lake by Brainerd. The old reservation ran from Brainerd city limits to Pequot Lake city limits. It was 25 miles long and 18 miles wide. And they moved us from Gull Lake and Crow Wing area to this area so that they could basically cut the red pine and white pine. And they bought that reservation from us. They call it seeding, C-E-D-I-N-G, in the treaty for, it was about average five cents an acre. We are uh, a branch uh, from a mother tribe called the Lenalapi, or the Delaware people from there. At one time we're on the East Coast, some are still there, but the government moved them down into the Oklahoma Territory. But they're the mother tribe that we come from, and we are woodland Indians from the uh, Delaware stock, and uh, we speak an Algonquin tongue like many of the tribes do. Some of the others are the Cree, and the uh, Menominee, the Budawatomi or Potawatomi, the Ottawa, the uh, Sac and Fox, the uh, Meskwakis, um, Kickapoos, and those are all like cousins tribes to us. At one time, the territory ran from the Ohio River to the Rocky Mountains and from the tundra in Can and Canada down into the Kansas Plains. So it was a huge territory. About 990 AD, we were residing in the area where the St. Lawrence River flows into the Atlantic Ocean. And our elders were having dreams and being told in the dreams to tell the people to move west. And so there was a series of stopping places along the way. And, um, and they, they said that a sacred shell would rise out of the water and we were to stop and have ceremony at that time and that represented the Medewin, which was one of our ceremonies for some of our people. And they said when the last time the shell rises out of the water, you'll be in your homeland and you'll know you're in your homeland when you find food growing out of the water. And that's wild rice. It is sacred to us. We are alive today because wild rice existed and it's prevalent at most of our ceremonies and feasts. We hold it in high esteem. We like to leave it natural the way the Creator created it. Dakota were in this region uh, for a period of time, and even before them, the Northern and Southern Cheyenne were in this region. So the Northern and Southern Cheyenne, and before them it was a ancient old Indians, what we call Gete, uh, Nishnabek, and then uh, about 1630, 1700, right in there, we started to move into the Great Lakes region. And then there was, uh, some say the Iroquois were uh, hot on our heels and we were hot on the Dakota's heels. And, 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 uh, and those are uh, interesting uh, matters of discussion. And then also there was, I would uh, surmise, a natural migration west too. 
A lot of the tribes moved according to seasons, according to the animal movements. Uh, if there was a drought or food sources were uh, plentiful or if they were scarce that um, dictated how and where they moved. And so, but it's also always uh, depicted that the Dakota and the Ojibwe fought. And there were times when we had our differences, but there were also many times when we intermarried. So many of our families are blended Dakota and Ojibwe. And um, we also hunted and fished and we got along probably more than we fought. True native time is not being late. It's, it's seasonal time. This time of year, they would probably be hunting and trapping. Just previous to this, they would have been ricing and uh, picking berries and other fruits and uh, vegetables uh, that were wild. And then also we had gardens we cultivated. By the way, 60% of stable agricultural crops worldwide come from native knowledge. And um, 400 medicines used by the AMA. And it would have been a time of year in the fall and also in the spring to pick medicine plants and roots and to use them to dry them and store them and, and we would have been busy storing drying preparing foods constantly they used to dig holes and bury uh, dried rice dried meat dried fruit dried vegetables and they were called food caches and they had those buried in numerous places throughout the region. And when they traveled, they remembered where they were buried and they would go dig them up. And they would dig a hole, line it with a hide, and then put them in uh, containers that we call muckucks. Or they would tie them in, in bags and then they would be dried. And uh, then they would cover them with a hide and then cover them with rocks and then cover them with dirt. And the rocks would keep the critters from getting at it because they got good noses and they know where that stuff is. But that's how we survived without uh, uh, frigid air and Amana and General Electric and all Philips and all the appliances. So you had to work 24 seven pretty much in order to eke out a living in, in this environment. And then wigwams were dwellings that were made of a stick frame and it was lashed together usually with basswood or some other kind of twine and um, then it was covered with a combination of birch bark and elm bark and then uh, reed mats and and then they use they would put those in layers and then the air would be used in between those layers as also insulation and then there would be a smoke hole in the top and they'd have a fire in the middle so the smoke would rise out and the heat would radiate in, in the dwelling place we know as a wigwam. We had a form of teepee that was shaped like a teepee but sometimes made out of hide but most of the time amongst our people it was made out of birch bark and that was called a nasaogan. We call Detroit Lakes uh, in, in our language and it literally means place where there's Sandbars all over heck, I guess is the way to interpret it. And so that's what we called the region. And uh, they were hunting and fishing and racing through this whole region for, well, probably since about the 16 or 1700s. There's big rice beds all through this country. There were deer, there were herds of buffalo. The first five years we were at White Earth, how they survived the winters is they shot buffalo, along mainly along 59 and west out in the prairie. At one time there was a lot of moose in the region. We still have moose up on the reservation. And the last few years we've curtailed the season to let the herd build up, so not to over harvest it. So. But we've got a lot of deer. And then the logging, they logged a lot of the big trees out and then the small popple suckers came up and that really set the deer herd in motion. And also it's good for partridge and other uh, species. When you clear cut, it's dangerous because you kill out the medicine plants because the sun gets right at the medicine plants and it burns them out. So it's better to select cut. What we have here is a map of the state of Minnesota and, and it's like a patchwork quilt. And the average price that Anishinaabe, Ojibwe and Dakotas were paid for the state of Minnesota is five cents an acre. And basically from Moorhead to St. Paul 
is I-94 and south of that is Dakota Territory and they were paid two cents an acre for 35 million acres and they still haven't been paid to this day so the government still kind of owes them some money plus simple interest. And we're in the area right here which was a 10 million acres treaty session in the 1855 treaty. And then just to the west of us was 1863, the Red River Valley Treaty. That was 9 million acres for 10 cents an acre. So you could view it that we native people have made a significant contribution to the state of Minnesota in the sense that we provided real estate and to the country that we provided real estate. And that uh, I think that's a good thing, but I think Indians should be given the credit for providing that contribution to the United States. On June 14, 2005, White Earth celebrated its 137th powwow. And that's a celebration of our arrival on June 14, 1868 from Gull Lake. In the old days, my grandparents told me historically, see the Dakota would come from the west and we would have a procession and go and meet them on the western boundary and, and ride with them in horse and buggy and buckboard wagons and on horses and have like a parade into town from the west and then from the north we would go and meet the Red Lake contingent. In the east we would go and meet probably from Leech Lake and from uh, maybe Mille Lacs and in the south would be Mille Lacs people. And so it was a big parade. Imagine like the state fair, the county fair, an ice cream social and a square dance all in one with a big feast. And part of it is ceremonial and part of it is social. It's a little uh, blend of uh, all of those things, but it's mostly a celebration of our arrival at White Earth. Before they put us on reservations, there were literally hundreds and thousands of villages through the Great Lakes area of family clusters of people living, and that's how we survived. I teach Native American studies at, uh, I'm an instructor at the White Earth Tribal and Community College which by the way, we're 10 years old this year and uh, we're in Manoman, Minnesota and it's open to Indian and non-Indian alike. It's a community college. <laughs>